uh, but a very warm welcome to this evening's uh, event uh, called How Lib Dems Can Win with Basic Income. Uh, my name is Michael Pugh and I am the director and co-founder of the Basic Income Conversation and we are really pleased to be partnering with the Social Liberal Forum and Lib Dems for a Basic Income to deliver this evening's event. Um, big thanks for, for, for joining us and a big thanks to those of you watching on YouTube uh, as well after the, uh, after the event. Welcome and thank you. Um, the Basic Income Conversation, we seek to embed basic income within all of the major political parties. We support groups in other parties uh, to do that, but we're really proud of our work to support Lib Dems for a basic income over the last nine months or so, which has seen basic income become part of party policy following the vote at last year's conference. Um, and I suppose the next step for any political party uh, and basic income is to ultimately to see if it's successful on this doorstep with voters. And that's the challenge and opportunity that we will be discussing this evening. We've got a brilliant panel of speakers to help unpack that. And I'll shortly hand over to our chair, Ian. Um, but first, a quick bit of housekeeping. Tonight is a webinar, uh, and that means everyone is muted uh, this evening, except from our speakers. Um, but those of you joining live uh, and tuning in do have a very important role to play. And I'd like to uh, see where everyone is calling in from this evening. If you could put your name uh, and where you're calling in from in the chat box, that would be brilliant just to get a sense of who's who's here this evening. And it's in that chat box that we'll be using to take questions later on. So there's more that will be explained later, but the chat box is where some of the action will be taking place. So do put your comments in there. Uh, for those watching back on YouTube, do leave comments on there too. We'd love to hear what you think. And, and yes, that means that tonight is being recorded. Uh, and so you'll be able to watch this back um, tomorrow when it's posted. But that's enough from me. Um, you'll hear, you won't hear from me again this evening, but for now over to your chair, who is going to, is Dr. Ian Cairns. Uh, he's the director of the Social Liberal Forum, uh, amongst many other talents, because he's former deputy director of the think tank IPPR. He's a co-founder and director of the European Leadership Network. He's also an advisor for the tech for good sector. Uh, but perhaps most importantly for us this evening, he's a big proponent of basic income, and he's been making the case for it within the Liberal Democrats. Uh, a, part, a party which he's a member of. So, to Ian, warm welcome uh, and over to you. Thank you, Michael, and thanks for all the work that you and others have put into uh, making this event possible uh, this evening. I'd like to just make a few opening remarks with regard to why we're, why we're here, what, why now. Um, I think everybody on the call will know um, that UBI, uh, Universal Basic Income, is being discussed more and more, not just here, but around the world. And there are, I think, multiple reasons for that. One would be, obviously, the immediacy of the problems caused by the pandemic and the real hardship that's been caused by that. But we also have long term historical trends underway, like automation and increasing um, precarious nature of work, which is causing significant difficulties for people. And I think that's also feeding into a, a very high level of anxiety, political anxiety, um, which also underpins, uh, I would argue, uh, populism as well. And so we're kind of here partly to, to talk about UBI as a potential answer, contributor to uh, answers to all of these challenges. And in particular, I think to the uh, a contributor to economic and psychological stability, I think, for people to, to address that anxiety as well as their try and meet their basic needs. And UBI is just one possible pathway to that and could be a major social justice advance. So that's the wider context, obviously. As I said, it's a global conversation and we'll be hearing um, uh, from a member of, Liberal Member of Parliament from who I will introduce in a moment from Canada. Um, but we're also here this evening because, as you know, this is, for those of you who are Lib Dems on the call, this is this has now been decided as a Lib Dem policy. Uh, and we have local elections uh, and uh, Welsh and Scottish parliamentary elections coming up in just a couple of months' time. And this is a distinctive policy for the Lib Dems in those elections. And we need to have a conversation and to be thinking about how we can make that policy advantageous for us uh, in those elections. And that's a big part of the conversation that we'd like to have uh, with everybody this evening. Now, having said that, we're not here to decide what the detailed implementation of the policy should be. The party has a working group 
uh, looking at that. Um, we might get into the issue, the important if issue of how to handle the question from voters, uh, should they ask it on the doorstep, you know, of how would you pay for it? Um, and I'll be interested to hear what panelists and contributors have to say uh, about that. Um, but we're really, as I say here, to, to discuss how we can make this policy work to our advent advantage in this electoral cycle uh, as a party. Now, to help us with, with all of that and to get to grips with all of that, we have a fantastic lineup of guests and participants. In the first part of the session this evening, we're going to discuss UBI with two, two people who've been active in promoting the idea, in articulating uh, ways in which it might work, uh, and doing so in, in their different ways and in different contexts. The first of those is Nate Erskine-Smith, a Liberal MP uh, in Canada for the Beaches East York riding in, uh, in Toronto. Um, after Nate, we'll turn to Chiwe Chahana of uh, UBI Lab Women uh, to hear about the work she's been doing and her perspective and insights on this. Um, each of them will make some opening comments uh, and I'll then engage them in a, in a short discussion, uh, picking up on some of the things they've said and their perspectives uh, and insights just for a few minutes. Uh, after that, we'll turn into a very Lib Dem focused part of the evening. We'll hear from uh, three uh, of our fantastic uh, leading uh, members of the party and activists in the party. Louisa Porritt, first of all, who's a former MEP and is currently our candidate for Mayor of London. We'll hear from Wendy Chamberlain, uh, Lib Dem MP for North East Fife. And we'll hear from Jane Dodds, um, former MP and currently leader of the Lib Dems in Wales. And in that part of the discussion, we'll be trying to get to the bottom of why each of these uh, leading Lib Dems is, is passionate about UBI, how they'd like to approach selling it on the doorstep themselves, but also hearing from them what kind of help they'd like, what kind of help they need uh, from other activists and people uh, working on this agenda in order to be able to sell this idea uh, positively. And then uh, following that part of the evening, we'll open out and we'll take uh, a lot of contributions via the chat function um, uh, from other uh, members of the audience and contributors. And we hope through that we can, we can have some back and forth and get some responses from, uh, from members of our, of our panel. Um, so that's the basic structure of, of the evening. Um, and, and so with that, let me, uh, let me turn first to, to Nate Erskine-Smith. Nate, uh, thanks so much for, for joining us from Canada uh, today, uh, evening for us. Um, but um, I know how busy your schedule will be, so we really appreciate you uh, finding the time in your schedule to do this. Um, I wonder if, um, if, you could, if you could just tell us a little bit where you're personally currently at in terms of thinking about UBI. I know you've been advocating for it, supporting it, working within your own party uh, to help advance the agenda. But just what's your current thinking on, you know, why we need this, why we, and, and I guess why we need it now, especially? Well, th first, thanks so much for having me and inviting me. I've been in Parliament here in Canada since 2015, and I have certainly raised the, really the need to raise the floor through basic income supports since I was elected in 2015 as a matter of fairness, but also as a matter of efficiency, because we know that direct cash transfers to individuals in need can lift people up in a really serious way, but can also be a really effective way of delivering support. So with that in mind, we have increased supports since 2015, specifically targeted supports for the Canada Child Benefit, where we help lift 300,000 kids out of poverty through a $25 billion direct cash transfer program to kids. We've increased something called the Canada Workers Benefit, much more modest, it's $2.2 billion. And there is a longstanding support for here in Canada, income supports for seniors, Old age, old age security and guaranteed income supplement. Collectively, the federal government spends between 55 and $60 billion direct cash transfers to senior citizens. And as a result, seniors, we have the lowest poverty rate among any demographic in Canada is, is our senior population. Still not zero, but but significantly lower than, than, other, than other populations, particularly the single working population. There, there are all sorts of political considerations that bring one to a basic income, in my view. Affordability touches politics in a serious way in all sorts of different ways. Fairness considerations, we ran on a platform of fairness in 2015 as really through the, that Canada Child Benefit in, in a serious way. 
dignity is a really poor, important part of that in terms of empowering people through making their choices themselves. And when we think of that focus on fairness today in particular, I think more and more people are increasingly concerned about income and wealth inequality and a basic income is part of the answer. I will say though, of course, we are living through a crisis, a health crisis, but an ensuing economic crisis. And here in Canada, I don't know what the numbers are in the United Kingdom, but in Canada, there were 9 million Canadians who sought support through the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which was an effective basic income for people who had lost employment and who had some minimal labor force attachment from the previous 12 months. And so 9 million Canadians who weren't able to quickly access employment insurance, maybe they were eligible, but administratively there were too many people seeking support and the system couldn't function in their time of need and millions more who simply wouldn't have been eligible for that employment insurance because they hadn't paid enough into that system. So we need, and, and this is how I certainly frame the conversation and will continue to do so, we need a social safety net. We need to reinvent our social safety net. It was not fit for purpose when we needed it most, and we needed a new social safety net that leaves nobody behind, and, and that's exactly what a basic income is. I, I will say in the Canadian context, we are lucky to have the social architecture that we have through some of these more targeted programs. It makes it a little bit easier to articulate a defense of basic income supports that we know that they work. We know that the guaranteed income supplement works for seniors and seniors understand that. We know that the Canada Child Benefit works for families with kids and families with kids understand that. I think really the missing middle, middle, the missing middle right now here in Canada in a really serious way is the working poor fundamentally, which is a, a poverty rate that is far too high. And as I say, the incomes of those targeted income supports don't reach them in a way that they ought to. So we have in Canada, there's a, been a strong conversation in our Liberal caucus. We have uh, a coming convention in April, and we've I worked with five of my Liberal colleagues to draft a resolution in support of a Canadian basic income, referencing many of these considerations. And that was prioritized first overall by my Liberal caucus in an, in an anonymous vote. So in April, we'll have that prioritized debate on that resolution and hopefully adopt it as party policy. We have though seen the prime minister and finance minister say, we don't see a way forward right now with a uh, basic income writ large. And so again, we're back to the conversation of how can we in the short term with the coming budget, increase income supports in a positive way and, and really seize the moment where Canadians overwhelmingly, I think people around the world are recognizing that we need to seriously take on these issues of fairness and really reinvent our social safety net. I suppose we can talk about pilot projects and, and we've had pilot projects here in Canada as well that there, there's a lot of evidence behind it and uh, that certainly I reference in, in the course of my advocacy. The cost is really, I think the conversation that needs to be broached is how do we pay for it? And that is ultimately, I think, the stumbling block currently with finance and with the prime minister's office. There are, I think, some answers to that conversation, but it is about collapsing certain programs together, basic personal amount here in Canada, potentially. There, there are, I think, serious conversations to be had about how we finance it. But overwhelmingly, I think, Canadians, and, and I hope people in the United Kingdom understand that this is a conversation that, that needs to happen and that the social safety net was not fit for purpose when we needed it most and, and it needs to be reinvented. I should say before, uh, before passing off, uh, just as a point of clarification on terminology. So when I speak of basic income, I'm very much focused on a minimum floor below which people won't fall. And I am not focused on sending $20,000 a year to a millionaire per se. So, and I think that language is incredibly important too. There, there will be many people support a universal approach, which is obviously much more expensive up front, at least. Those politics, for me, at least, I, I see as more challenging. And so I have been much more focused on a, an effective floor, a minimum floor that will leave nobody behind, and effectively a negative income tax from there that by the time you're earning a salary like mine, I would receive no benefit from the government. Anyway, thanks for having me, and I look forward to questions. No, thank, thank, thanks a lot, uh, Nate, for that. So it seems one, one thing very that you made point I think you made in a very compelling way is, is just to say to people look if if the systems we were currently using to handle uh, these kinds of challenges were were fit for purpose that we you know we wouldn't have needed all this extra money we've just had to pump in from the government in the heat of this crisis right so there right there there's a kind of what's so good about the status quo kind of question right it's not working it's broken and therefore the only debate in town is is how do we fix it and and here's a potential solution right I just wonder um how you yourself, because I'm sorry to sort of cut to the chase, but how you yourself handle this in conversations with voters? Uh, if you're if you're talking directly on the doorstep, and if you do get that question, you know this sounds great, but how would you pay for it? 
I mean, obviously there's detailed implementation questions in there. And I take the caveats that you've just kind of wrapped around that in terms of what you specifically mean by this. But I'm just wondering what kind of arguments do you deploy when you get into those doorstep conversations with voters? Right, so there are a number of, of answers to that. One, we are already in the game, 55 to $60 billion on old age security, $25 billion for families with kids. We spend 50 plus billion dollars on the basic personal amount, which works backwards, by the way. $50 billion, that means the full basic personal amount is captured by upper income earners and zero is captured by people who are nothing at all. And we need to flip that. So there is, I would say, one, we are in the game and we spend money on basic income supports. We need to expand those basic income supports. That's the first answer. The second answer is when we look at the total cost, we thankfully have a parliamentary budget officer here in Canada that has crunched some numbers and some analyses that, that have been brought to bear say when you strip out the duplicative social assistance that is spent by the provinces and you were to say claw back that back, if you're to roll in, say the Canada workers benefit, the GST, GST tax credit, some of these other measures that would again be duplicated by a basic income, you'd be looking at $25 billion in your spending. That is certainly not insurmountable. Obviously in a, in a crisis like this, it would have been more costly. But again, we have delivered over $100 billion in support to people directly individually through the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. So we are already doing this very same thing. And when we need it most, we, we spent the money because Canadians needed it. And, and I guess the last point to emphasize is there will be savings. It's, it's not snap of the fingers and see savings tomorrow, but when we look at healthcare costs, when we look at costs to the criminal justice, in, in the criminal justice system, when we look at the costs of a, a lack of social mobility, these are real costs that our government already pays and that our economy already bears. So a basic income, I don't think, will pay for itself so very simply, but in the medium to long term, there will be significant savings accrued. And so it is certainly something that we can afford. And, and I've you know, been reading a, a, a significant amount of literature of those who support it, who identify, as I say, the basic personal amount that, that could be used. There are existing programs in the system that could be readily used to, to finance a basic income in a serious way. Right. So, and do you sometimes frame that directly as, I, I mean, so the savings that you're touching on there, uh, I mean, that's through prevention, right? That's actually a whole series, you know, that's actually investing money up front, as it were, in preventing social problems, rather than picking up the cost for them afterwards. So that's where the savings are coming from. That's what you're saying, right? Right. And, and it's an idea that the health literature has emphasized for many years, and politics has been slow to catch up, I think. But when, when we talk about the social determinants of health, income is a key social determinant of health. Those who don't have income, and, and again, it's not perfect. We, we continue to need additional supports as it relates to those with disabilities, as it relates to those who really have serious housing needs and a basic income isn't going to cure housing needs entirely. But we know that income insecurity is a key social determinant of health. And we know from at least the basic income pilot that we saw in the 1970s here in Canada, we know that those who were supported through a basic income saw healthcare costs deeply re reduce. So we know that there can be savings and, and absolutely it is a matter of prevention. And, and this is, I really do think this is politicians that need to catch up to the evidence as it relates to the social determinants of health. Absolutely. Uh, ju just one one more from me, if I may. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of the overall positioning of the Liberal Party in Canada, um, uh, and, and I guess philosophically as well, really, to what extent do you personally and do you think the party more widely is is thinking of this as a distinctively liberal idea? I mean, you know, we at the Social Liberal Forum, where, where I'm the director, we we kind of define liberalism in some ways as, as about spreading power and wealth to people so they can be the masters of their own destiny. And certainly this is about giving people enough of an income that, that, you know, that, that they can do more than just, just survive. Um, but do you guys also think about it philosophically in terms of, you know, here's a platform upon which people can be freer, let's say in liberal terms. It unquestionably is a liberal idea when you think through ideas like autonomy, and dignity and unquestionably giving individuals the power to one, avoid the welfare wall and the welfare trap and jumping through too many hoops to get the basic income, minimum income that they deserve and, and to have that sense of dignity. I, I think we want to move away from that kind of administration and give people greater support directly and, and that will empower them in a more serious way. Uh, I suppose I, I would also say the 
uh, from a, a liberal perspective, you, you also want to emphasize that this is both fair, but it is also smart, that this is an effective way of administering direct cash transfers to individuals to, to support those in need. And so I think there are a number of arguments that can be brought to bear along liberal lines. I, the real push ultimately, as I say, comes down to how can we finance this? That, that's been my experience in Canada, which is why what we end up seeing is, is more incremental changes. So as I mentioned, we see the Canada Child Benefit increase. We increase the guaranteed income supplement for seniors by 10%. Right now, I'm really pushing to increase the Canada Workers Benefit. And, and so we're seeing more incremental steps along those lines. But if you have a moment in your politics where you are building a party and, and building a platform of a party to really reinvent itself, then I think this is an idea that absolutely can draw from the liberal tradition and to allow for that reinvention. Thanks very much. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people on the call who, who will appreciate that sentiment. And uh, I wish we had a lot more time to, to talk, but I really appreciate that uh, quick injection of, of thinking and insight from your perspective. I don't know if your schedule allows you to stay with us for longer. We won't be offended if you need to leave, but I just wanted to thank you for, uh, for that contribution. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And I, I suppose the, the, the only other thing I would say, because oftentimes there are myths around basic income, and I appreciate you having me, is just around disincentives to work. And we know, again, smart policy can be structured for staggered phase clawback that will not disincentivize work. So again, it's an opportunity to show that liberals are evidence-based decision makers and crafters of smart policy that will deliver great fairness. So I think there, the basic income conversation holds great promise for liberal Democrats in a really serious way. I, I'm able to stick around for a, a little bit, but I'll probably leave in, in 10, 10, 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so to get, to get back at it. That's great. Th thanks so much, Nate. Uh, I'll turn next to uh, Chiwe Chahana uh, from UBI, uh, UBI Lab Women. Um, Chiwe, I guess, uh, I know you have a few slides you want to share with us, but um, also I just wondered if you could uh, tell us a little bit about UBI Lab and U UBI Lab Women. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to do that on the slides and also why you're, you're kind of passionate about this idea. You're spending a lot of time working really hard on the UBI uh, agenda. If you could just give us your take on, on why you think it's so badly needed now. Over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so yeah, I am from uh, UBI Lab. The, the, my name is Chiwe Chihana. I'm from the UBI Lab Network, and I'm also co-founder of UBI Lab Women. Um, UBI Lab Women was founded last year in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just one second, I just need to get my slides. Sorry, just one second. Yeah, I'll probably just speak um, okay. off the cuff if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I am from uh, UBI Lab Women, and um, uh, so the U which is part of the multiple grassroots uh, uh, grassroots groups that have been established through the UBI Lab Network. The UBI Lab Network. It believes that there are better ways to provide security to citizens and build more resilient uh, economies. Um, we currently have 38, uh, 38 labs, some are um, local to the UK, some are international, then some are non-geographic. Uh, non um, part of the work that we are currently doing is uh, around um, what's called the cross-party parliamentary, par parliamentary uh, group on uh, local, and local, parliamentary and local government group on UBI. And we've also got um, a project at the moment that looks at um, council motions. And I think that those would primarily be the most resonate uh, for a, 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 an audience like we have today. Um, so I've been asked to tackle this from um, a women's perspective, touch a bit on race and, and, and how we would actually probably engage the grassroots in, 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 um, with, 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 in an election uh, context. So why um, a universal basic income? We believe that a universal basic income gives people the dignity to make their own choices, the ability to live up to their potential, and also just improved economic stability going into, especially uh, given the context of this pandemic. Um, with the challenges that, um, that, that the pandemic actually brought, um, 
when we saw a lot of people fall off the safety nets that were provided by the government here in the UK. Um, I think similar things have happened around the world. So meaning that more people have been pushed into poverty um, and also the dignity that they didn't have anyway with the precarious universal credit system, for example, here in the UK, that just means that that's even gotten worse. People's mental health. Um, and also when we're talking about women in particular, uh, the ability to choose, for example, uh, we think that a universal basic income itself would help with would facilitate women to make better choices if they're working in an environment where they're being abused for example um, they can make choices to shift uh, to change uh, employment um, in a domestic situation they can make choices to actually leave that environment what we've also seen as well is um, in, in quite a lot of uh, pilots of, that have taken place around the world, including what we've, um, I think what uh, Nate was talking about in Canada, we've seen um, pilots that have taken place in places like Finland, in India, um, and, and the benefits to women of those pilots have shown that women have actually become more entrepreneurial, uh, some of them have gone on to, to change careers, um, their families as well as we've seen in the Mississippi uh, uh, pilot, um, their children have benefited by extension, by going, uh, by doing better in school, mental health has improved. And especially, I guess, for me as a black woman and also the black community and uh, black and ethnic minority communities within the UK, a universal basic income would empower, uh, would empower uh, the black, uh, the BAME community and also, um, take away some of the stigma that is affiliated with uh, the, the poverty levels that uh, people from ethnic minority uh, backgrounds are affiliated with and that they keep being uh, crushed into, uh, it's a vicious cycle. And so a basic income would be able to do that. And also because a universal basic income would, would not be, um, a universal basic income would not be, would, would not be subject to, um, to, to, to red tape as we currently experience with uh, universal credit systems, that would empower more people who actually need it to go to, 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 to receive it. So we champion, uh, we champion that a universal basic income should be available to everyone. Um, but of course, we, we're still talking about uh, pilots, piloting a universal basic income. Um, where else? Um, we think that a universal basic income would be transformative for women and it would also be it would also tackle the financial insecurities that we've seen looking at even prior to the pandemic um in, in, women's income for example uh, was far less than that of men across the spectrum across race race barriers and so we're looking at that and i think the women's budget group placed that up uh women's chances of falling into poverty at about extreme poverty as at 2019 by 73%. So that again is something that is, is key to why we would want to see more trials and also a message that would go really well hand in hand with the grassroots um, organizations in campaigning for basic income. It gives impetus for people to actually say, this party is standing for me and, and this is why. I'm going to be empowered in this way. I'll be uh, I'll be able to um, I'll be able to earn. I'll be able to make to make choices with my life, and that's all people want. People want dignity from poverty. People want economic justice, and this is what people want to hear on the grassroots. When I started speaking, I spoke about um, our CPPLG, for example, which is a combination of elected representatives from around the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. So. Uh, the CPPLG is currently chaired by Christine Jardine, who is, is with the Lib Dems, if you will. And what it does is that the, uh, the, we've come to, the elected representatives have come together to actually engage with the councillors and, and to get exactly what's happening on the ground. And we think that that information that is shared between the two bridges the gap between Westminster and the grassroots organisations and the person who is going to be electing um, the, their, their next representative. We think that that's an important uh, part of what would help with winning um, the next election, if you will. That's great. Th thanks very much, Chiwe. Um, I think some, you know, some clear common themes there with uh, the contribution that we had before you from 
from Nate around uh, around dignity, also that this is a better way. This will be a better way of providing the kind of security we're talking about. Um, very interesting additional points you made, I think, around increasing choices for vulnerable people. Really, whether it's whether it's people facing challenges of domestic abuse or abuse and uh, uh, problems in the workplace and so on. That actually, if you can give that, if they feel a little more economically secure, they have that extra space to make a choice that they may otherwise just not be able to make for those for those economic reasons so i think really interesting spin there uh, not spin rather just a, a kind of interesting twist on the some of the standard arguments that get made around ubi um could you say a little a little bit more about the council motions um and and what you're doing there and and where they for you kind of fit into the strategy of how you you can try and make some of this change come about yes and certainly um and thanks a lot for asking me because I, I feel like I rushed through that without really tackling that. It's, a, it's our it's our fault. We we have too many <laughs> too many people being asked to get too much into too short a time. So it's our, it's our our fault. Carry right. on. Uh, so we 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 the, the the UBI labs based on their localities are encouraging cancer um, the councils to. Um, to, to adopt the piloting of a, U, a UBI. So Sheffield, in, in our case, and, and they we're not the only ones, of course, this uh, Scotland that also led into a feasibility study, but uh, Sheffield was the first one for, our, for us. Uh, was it for Sheffield? Actually one of the first ones. So we've asked councils to, um, to consider the piloting of a UBI. And for us, that means that it gets good media attention. Uh, it means that uh, at grassroots level, uh, people are being able to be fed to, to feed into what's being discussed around UBI and they get to hear it right at the local level and not at the very high echelons of society where they can't actually find, find relations. So the people at the grassroots are tackling uh, UBI emotions from the context of that particular area where they live. Mm -hmm. I think and, and, there are about 18 council motions now that have been passed, 28 council motions. Thanks, Anne Gregory. Yeah. Right. And so your perception is that you're getting some real traction um, for this agenda, as you say, right down at the grassroots level. I presumably, presumably, lots of councillors coming up real close to um, to the poverty and insecurity they're seeing in their in their wards. Um, we, the we, de the we definitely we definitely are seeing a lot of traction. Um, we've seen that what well, the resources that we've created have also been adopted by other councils and not necessarily within the UBI lab network. Um, and it's also important to note that the cross party parliamentary and local group government group that I mentioned earlier has actually got councillors from some of those councils that have adopted um, that, that have adopted the, the council motions as well. So there's a good flow of information. And, and, and an exchange of knowledge as well between uh, parliamentarians, um, mayors, as well as councillors, and mm -hmm. it's cross-party, as well as the local press. So the only way you can harness local press is through grassroots organisations and grassroots political movements, such as at council level. Yeah. I mean, that, that's very heartening to hear, and you're passion and commitment to this agenda really, really comes across. Uh, I just wonder if you could say finally, in terms of just a question from me, uh, something you haven't touched on, but I'm wondering what kind of pushback are you getting when you're, when you're working on this agenda? What kind of arguments are you getting back against you and, and how are you handling those? Um, the, 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 the current big one I think that we, we are getting is what Nate also alluded to. It's how it's going to be paid for. And so the UBI lab network has got lots, uh, is tackling uh, the conversation around UBI by getting lots of researchers, campaigners, activists to actually look at different models of that. And um, we, we, we don't particularly say, this is the one that you're going to be using, or this is the one that's, the, the, that's going to be there, but there's a, there's a menu of options that can be considered and that's there within the UBI lab network. I suppose the other one, um, the other challenge that I, I personally face is when I bring in the concept of universality of basic income and um, the question of people with no recourse to public funds, for example, 
um, where do they where do they get placed in that in that in that conversation? But I also I think for me my personal pushback I don't know whether this represents the network, but my personal pushback is that if you empower every person that's able to feed into the economy, uh, then surely you're paying back into a system that's actually going to sustain that. So um, I find that that's an important response, probably to give at the doorstep, if you will. Yeah. That, that's great. Thanks so much, Chiwe. And again, I, I wish we had more time to uh, to talk. Um, you're doing really fantastic work. And as I say, your passion and commitment for it really, really shines through. Um, I am, I am though, going to have to push on quickly because I, I'm going to turn to Louisa Porritt because I know Louisa has to leave uh, the meeting in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, at least that's what I've been told. Um, Louisa, nice to see you and thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I want to start with you, if I may, by by just asking you, uh, you know, why you're personally passionate about this, and and what what persuaded you of the value of of UBI. Well, thanks, Ian, and it's great to be with everyone this evening and see that people have tuned in from all over the country and and globally as well. That's brilliant. Um, I actually came to UBI before I even came to the Liberal Democrats, so it predated my membership. Um, I studied international economic policy for my master's degree and with some friends at the time and others, uh, we set up a kind of think tank um, for young people to um, get them more interested and involved in economic policy making because being millennials, we were all graduates um, of the last recession in 2008. Um, and so we've only ever known a really insecure jobs market. And it was around this time that people started to talk about UBI, but it was still really quite an early uh, concept. Um, we did a podcast about it and it was really through um, doing research into that that I learned about the trials that had already taken place in places like Finland and Switzerland and actually where trials have been carried out, we've, we've heard it from Nate about Canada, they have been successful. Um, the outcomes have been really good and I think now is really the moment for us to be looking at this in the UK and the proof is in the response to this crisis really. We've seen that there have been various government schemes introduced in a very sort of reactive way to uh, the circumstances but loads of people have fallen through the cracks and we have a huge number of self-employed people in this country. In London there's around a million of them and lots of them weren't eligible for the government support that was introduced. Uh, the schemes um, that were introduced were often quite late, so people were left for months uh, worrying about their income. And it's something that's quite personal to me because I've been self-employed for years, actually, apart from the time when I was an MEP, of course. Um, so I know what it's like anyway to live with that insecurity and not know exactly how much income you're going to get each month, how much you'll be paid. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of um, uh, clients out there who don't necessarily pay invoices on time. So we had a, a, a problem there for a lot of people that predated this crisis. And now we have a lot more people who need that little bit of extra support. There are people who've lost their jobs through no fault of their own as a result of this crisis, um, many more families and individuals pushed into food poverty and goes to that basic point of dignity that's already been mentioned. Um, people shouldn't have to be worrying about living hand to mouth. And I think fundamentally, universal basic income is, is a very liberal concept. It's freeing for people because um, what it does is it means that people um, are not just using all their sort of mental energy, worrying about paying the bills each month um, and having to work just to survive. And, and we know that so many people are, are working and still unable to make ends meet. So it's that little like bit of extra security, that layer mm -hmm. that then gives people the opportunity uh, to explore other things that they can do with their lives. Um, yeah 
to explore different career paths. Um, lots of people are going to need, need to retrain, not only as a result of having lost um, work during the pandemic, but because of other forces that were already in motion before this, like automation, for example. Mm -hmm. And we need to think about how we're going to plug those gaps as a society um, and, yeah. and not just leave people to these multiple crises that are kind of sure. out of our way. Um, but well, I think- it certainly seems to me that, sorry, I was going to say, it certainly seems to me that we're, we're in an, an era politically and in just in terms of what's happening, where the systemic crises, I mean, are just precisely that, systemic, they're multiple, they're interlinked, and actually we're in a period where small, small solutions just aren't going to cut it, right? But I'm really interested just to, and sorry to interrupt your flow there, but I really, I know you haven't got much time, and I, I really want to ask you this quite pointed question in a way, which is, you know, you're, you're the Lib Dem candidate for the mayoralty in London. So you're, you know, right in the heat of this at the moment. Mm -hmm. I saw comments recently from the Tory candidate, Sean Bailey, who was basically saying, if you give people this money, they'll spend it on drugs, et cetera. I mean, the guy's a kind of walking bag of prejudices, right, and ignorance. Um, but how are you dealing with selling that? You know, how, how are you dealing with this yourself in your own campaign for the mayoralty in terms of, you know, it being a distinctive position for the party and just how you deal yourself with the voters on the doorstep, uh, well, when you get a chance to talk to them on the doorstep um, and, and with, you know, directly with somebody like Bailey. Um, I mean, this guy, don't even get me started on him. It's just one of a string of ridiculous things that he's come out with. And as you say, very prejudiced statements as well. I mean, this is an argument that you often get from the right and, it's so lazy, um, you know, the idea that um, if you give people this, this level of security, they're going to immediately look to abuse it. Well, actually, we know that most people don't do that, by and large. Um, so, you know, just because there may be a few that do, doesn't mean you should deprive other people who would really benefit from that, of, of that opportunity. Um, it's a bit like the argument that also comes from the other side, which is why should I give money to rich city bankers? Well, there are other ways to address um, the inequality as aspects of that through the tax system. But it doesn't mean we should then deprive the vast majority of people um, who would need it and whose lives could be transformed by introducing it. Um, in terms of how, how we campaign on it, I think this is a moment where people are really open to new and big ideas actually, because they understand that the pandemic has fundamentally disrupted our world, our society, the way that we live and work. And so I think it's it's quite an easy time to be putting forward big radical ideas actually. And I'm certainly not afraid of doing that in, in the London campaign, so... Um, uh, I'm not Are worried you? about Sean Bailey's reaction. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, and, um, Caroline Pigeon has already put forward a motion on the London Assembly. She actually did it with um, Sean Berry from the Greens. Um, and I think it's quite a good issue for us because it, it really puts Labour on the spot, actually. Um, because they say that they're the party about that are all about freeing people from poverty, um, that they want to address inequality, but actually um, they're really not sort of convinced of this idea. And I know we've got to convince people within the Lib Dems as well. Um, but I think, it, kind of going back to what I was saying at the beginning, this is a liberal idea. Um, it's, it's about empowering people to live their lives more freely and fully and to be happy. And at the moment across politics, everyone's using this quite trite statement of building back better. Well, what do we mean by that? I think what we mean is that we want people to, to live in a, in a happier way in future. And, and that a lot of these inequalities that are, we knew were there, but have been brought to the surface through the crisis cannot be allowed to continue and to deepen, which is a real risk right now if we don't come up with some, some big ideas and radical solutions. Right. Two, two, two quick uh, final ones from me, Louisa, and you, you've got about 60 seconds, I know. So <laughs> um, so the first one is just really, what, what specifically are you calling for in London as a part of your campaign? Are you calling for pilots in a particular borough or 
you know, is there something concrete that you're you're actually calling for there? And then and then just finally, I mean, we've got a lot of people on this uh, call tonight who are activists and who are creating materials and doing various things as part of this UBI campaign. What do you need? What help do you need to to, to make this a bigger part of your campaign and to really use it as a distinctive policy to help win votes? Yeah. Well, Caroline's read, uh, led on this really, really, and um, what she said in the motion is, is that London should pilot this concept, that we should explore how to make it work in practice. And I think the reason why people are often a bit reticent about introducing it is immediately they start thinking about all sorts of practical and technical hurdles. How are we going to pay for this? How are we going to make it work in practice? Is everybody going to be covered? Um, well, that's why we need to actually just start the work and do the research um, to understand that. So I think actually um, selling it to people as, as a pilot, first and foremost, it is a bit of an easier sell as well. Um, and I, you know, London actually has had the highest level of unemployment in this pandemic um, of any UK region. And so I think um, people recognise there's a particular scale of the jobs crisis um, that the capital is facing. So there's there's a good argument there, I think, for us to lead on this and to be trying new things that could then maybe be rolled out elsewhere in the country. So that's the way I'd put it in quite sort of pragmatic terms, really. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I know you've got to go off to, an, to another meeting. We appreciate you being with us. And thanks very much for that contribution. I'm going to turn next to um, Wendy Chamberlain. Uh, hi, Wendy. Nice to see you. Um, Wendy, for those of you who don't know, is the M Liberal Democrat MP for North East Fife. Um, Wendy, I'd like to put the same questions to you, essentially, starting with, you know, why, why are you personally passionate about this? And, and has there been something in particular, a particular moment or issue? Is it the pandemic? What, what's kind of turned you on to, to this particular uh, idea right now? Thanks, Ian, and uh, yeah, hello to uh, everybody. Great to see such a fabulous uh, set of panelists and uh, and our, our, our master there in terms of Ian. Uh, but also, um, I think this is a really important topic, and I think Louisa is right that you know now is the time as we potentially uh, face a, a roaring twenties um, of this uh, century for 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 big ideas and and dealing with some of the structural um, inconsistencies we see in society. And the fact that Nate is here suggests that it is exactly that. These are global issues being faced by countries across the world. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I was a police officer for 12 years in my early 20s uh, and, and, and 30s and actually started my service in one of the most deprived areas in, in Edinburgh where there was you know, just systemic, systemic uh, generational uh, worklessness and uh, no incentive for, for people in those communities to, to get out of that. So I suppose I was always, and maybe that's one of the, the things that set me on the, the road to becoming a Liberal Democrat, but uh, certainly feeling that there was much more that could be done uh, to help and support people um, so that they could uh, get themselves out of the poverty trap, which is something that I've seen on the chat a bit. Um, since I came into Parliament, which was only in December 2019, so the reality is for me that the majority of my time in Parliament has been shaped by the, pan the pandemic. And I suppose at the outset, you know, the argument that the government gave in relation to its response on universal credit uplift on um, furlough, et cetera, was that there was a need to use existing mechanisms of the tax system, for example, in order to be able to get the support to people quickly. But what has clearly happened, and I'm now the DWP spokesperson for the party, having taken that on in September, is that... Um, you know, the safety net that is supposed to help people. And indeed, there are people who are coming into contact with that safety net who have never um, done so before are finding that there are pretty honestly some huge holes in it uh, and uh, things that they need to jump through. And, um, and also that uh, it simply isn't enough to live on. So obviously, you know, I actually just came back from uh, voting tonight on the budget. We voted against uh, the freezing to personal tax thresholds that's going to come in next year because we believe it's a stealth tax that will mean that poorer people are disproportionately paying a greater proportion of their income in tax than those at the those at the higher end so you know these issues are are, are all interlinked so so for me i think i was on the journey the pandemic has really been the thing that's 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 brought me to the other side and believed that actually um in order to 
Stop Food Banks, which I'm a vice chair of our APPG for ending food banks here in Parliament, um, and for giving people the options in terms of what, what they do and, and how they live their lives and free them from conditionality and, and aspects, the really punitive aspects of universal credit that we are seeing and data say it take away the cliff edges that we're seeing so the government have obviously agreed to to extend the 20 pound uplift to universal credit until september what does that do that just creates another cliff edge and of course and i have also seen in the chat references to those with disabilities the reality is is you know there are many more disabled people on legacy benefits who have seen absolutely no in increase in their, their benefits uh, at all so for me it is a broken system that is not fit for purpose and actually sometimes you've got to you've got to burn down this house to build something better and i think ubi is is definitely part of that Ian. thanks very much um i mean i can see that um that what you're saying what one what other speakers have already said as well about the system the current system being fundamentally broken. That that seems pretty clear to me. It also seems clear to me that the a very large number of people in the country have just been massively relieved and have thought it was the right thing for the government to do to provide this uh, huge amount of support during the uh, during the pandemic. But but you can also you can also see the kind of counterattack from the right coming here, which is going to be, you know, I think everybody knows this uh, this can't go on forever. This kind of amount of government spending can't go on forever, um, and so you know, and and then you can see them sort of finding their way back to the argument that there's no magic money tree, right? So um, no, now now obviously 30, I don't agree. <laughs> there's thirty seven billion pounds for a test, trace, and isolate system. Sure, there's sure. Look, I, I mean, I saw a figure. I, in the chat about 67 billion as a, as a figure to implement UBI. And I absolutely also agree with on the chat that, you know, you, the, the whole purpose of the UBI motion, which Jane and others did so much work on at conference in September, and, and obviously I spoke on and supported, is the first step of the journey. We actually need to quantify what we mean as a party uh, by UBI, and then actually the doorstep conversations potentially come from there. But, but I, th I, I think that's right, absolutely. And I completely, of course, agree with you about the amount of money the government is wasting on all kinds of stuff but I, I but i was just kind of moving on to that territory of how do you how do we win the argument for this politically mm -hmm. and there will clearly be a point at which where this does come down to you know here's a costed proposal but in this current electoral cycle we've got over the next few months where you know we're not going to have a costed proposal and those detailed detailed answers what's your take on how we can we can make this a vote winner for us in, in this electoral cycle um uh, and deal with some of that, those kinds of arguments we will get. I think quite honestly, I think it's going to be challenging to win it in this election cycle when we're talking about something that's nine weeks away and being conducted in a pandemic. Myself in Scotland, eh, for those Scots that are on the call here, we can't start delivering leaflets till next week. We can't start knocking doors in, in, until April. So I think there is a bit of me that I think we have to be realistic about what we can achieve in May. But I think what we have already achieved is we are starting to make those kind of radical thoughts and solutions part of the conversation. Um, and, um, and, and starting to, to challenge some of the orthodoxies around our, our tax and, and, and welfare sus system. And I think that's actually how we create a distinctive voice and get ourselves uh, into, the, in, into the conversation. In terms of the doorstep conversations, you know, what I've had is, is what, you know, the ones I've had in the limited time I've been able to over the last year have almost been how I've described in terms of, you know, the government argued that it needed to take steps quickly and use the existing systems but actually too many people have fallen through the gaps now and we have to accept therefore that we need to do something different and the reality is is you know so many people have been impacted not just in terms of this illness itself but actually in terms of the other aspects and i think you know the lift we're seeing in the government's polling just now is is vaccine related but actually, when it looks like the, look about the economic supports, I think there's definitely a degree of scratchiness there. So when we think about furlough, for example, what I'm getting on furlough when I'm on constituency calls is that it's actually a different furlough from a year ago. And when businesses are closed, they can't actually afford the contributions they're already having to make even without the increased expectations that the government will have later this year. And actually part of that is, is because they have uh, they feel as good employers a real obligation to their employees to keep going but potentially there's a point where they're going to have to just say I can't incur any more debt I'm going to have to shut the shutters yeah but I'll just finish in terms of my my questions uh, to you Wendy with the same one I ended on with Louisa really which is 
given the kind of we've got all these activists on the call and, and many of them are producing you know creative material and other things on um, this as part of the campaign for ubi are there things that you need do you think in in, in the campaigning you're doing and that you're about to be stepping up even more I think, you know, so I'm also part of, as a result of what was agreed at our policy at Federal Conference, I am part of the working group um, that Federal Policy Committee set up to actually answer so many of the questions that have come up in the chat in terms of how much, what benefits does it play, replace, how does it interact with the tax system. So I suppose for people, Liberal Democrats on the call, I'd assure you that that, that work is, is, is ongoing and, and clearly will be brought to a, a future conference. I suppose there's a key question for me of, you know, we're in our bubble and we're in our bubbles even more than, than we've ever been uh, over the last 12 months. Um, and I suppose for me it is, how do we, is UBI the right term? We all know what we, we well, do we all know what we mean by UBI? I suppose that's maybe part of it that's coming up in the, in the chat. Um, you know, what are the central tenants? And actually, is it the right word? And how do we? Because I saw that there was arguments that you could potentially make on the right in relation to UBI from that dignity, freedom to make on, on choices, uh, benefits of, of, of direct cash transfer, that potentially, how do we frame what we mean, you know, what, what, what's, what's the package? What's the, what's the microwave ready um, UBI caption? I think that's the, that, that would be something that I would, because I think we're all talking about broadly similar things, but you know, we probably just need some central, key central principles. Great, thanks Wendy. I'm gonna turn now to Jane. Hi Jane, nice to see you. Um, uh, Jane, as, as most of you, I think, will know, former MP and, and currently leader of the Lib Dems in Wales, uh, also a very passionate campaigner uh, on social justice issues. Jane, um, same questions to you, I'm afraid. Very predictable, I know. But um, um, it, I, I, is this a long term thing that you've been working on or have you come to this much more recently? And if so, what, what kind of switched you on to it? Yeah, well, thanks very much, Diego Maria, and also Thaki Geed from Wales. Um, I was one of those people who, uh, when I heard about universal basic income, I did say, don't be so ridiculous. That is a mad idea. The idea of giving everybody the same amount of money, millionaire to somebody who's really struggling. But the more I looked into it, the more I thought about uh, how innovative it was. Um, and I've, I then just started to research more and more about it. I also um, looked back at Welsh history and I looked at uh, Aneirin Bevan, who invented, I guess, the NHS in 1946. I kind of thought maybe that this, these are sort of some of the sorts of things he was facing then, you know, the kind of what a stupid idea. Surely you mean healthcare for everybody? no matter who they are, no matter what their background is. And let's not forget that Anirin Bevan in 1946 faced opposition. The Tories voted against it 21 times. They said the NHS was the first step to turn Britain into a national socialist economy. Uh, and doctors voted against the NHS, can you believe it as well, by 10 to one. So look, um, I'm not saying this is gonna be easy, but in chairing the Lib Dems for UBI group, uh, I feel we've got an amazing group of people behind us and we've got a real vision for a change in society. And that's really what this is all about. It's about a different society going forward, which says we want fairness and we want freedom. So those are the two things that I hold in my head when I'm thinking about it and when I'm talking to people about it as well. Fairness and freedom. And are you... Um, are you finding that um, when you're actually engaging with voters directly, um, are you finding that there's a receptivity to this or that there, are, you know, there is that kind of disbelief? Um, it's really interesting, isn't it? I, I think we sometimes create uh, something that may not even be there um, because I think a lot of voters, once you start talking to them about it, it does make sense to them. Um, and here in Wales last week, um, we had some research by the Future Generations Commissioner who um, is responsible for making sure that our unique act here in Wales, the Future Generations Act, is actually working for everything. She found that 69% of people in Wales wanted to trial 
a system of universal basic income. So I don't think we are that far off. Um, we just need to continue to have those conversations. There will be people who won't, who won't, you know, want to go with it. But let's not forget an Irene Bevan in uh, 1946. And let's really talk about how it can transform our society, how it will give everyone the chance to care, the chance for people to have a different career, the chance for people to not be poor and queue at food, food banks. Those are the real things that make a difference to people's lives. And that's what we should talk to them about. Great, thanks, Jane. I'm, I'm gonna, uh, I'm just sort of signaling now to, to, to Daniel and, uh, and John, uh, I'm going to come to some uh, questions out of the chat um, in, in just a moment. Um, and I'm sorry that we're running about 10, 10 minutes behind schedule, but I honestly didn't feel I could shorten anybody there without being really impolite. And pe the people have made such rich contributions. I just wanted to say, just well, uh, to give you a minute to pull up one or two, two points or questions to bring in, Daniel. Um, I also, you know, was aware of that history of the of doctors campaigning against the the NHS and so on. I also, when I was on a an academic to sabbatical to Canada for a year, quite a long time ago, I actually came across something I hadn't realised before, which is that when they were setting up the the health uh, the so, the kind of socialised health system in Canada, um, the doctors there, lots of the doctors there, actually went on strike to try to break the introduction of the socialised system. And quite a lot of doctors from the UK, from the National Health Service, were flown to Canada and actually basically given cars in places like Saskatchewan, given cars and address to go to, and just basically went there and practiced medicine uh, to make sure that the government's policy there could be delivered. In other words, doctors from the NHS went and broke the strike uh, uh, against the introduction of such a system in Canada. And it was just really, uh, I find it a very moving story. Daniel, what have we got from chat? Hi. Um, okay, so just to, to get back to the, the crux of what we're discussing here, which is in effect the sort of local elections, I think there's quite a lot of um, quite a lot of different questions that come back to the same thing, which is, you know, for example, from Matthew Halbert here, how can this be related through the, to the bread and butter discussions of council elections on the doorsteps? We don't often get into long form discussions on theory. It's more about the local issues. Um, Similarly, uh, other people saying, you know, while we wait for actual figures, could we at least have some basic rules of thumb that we can use about what we can say, like, say for, you know, th this is an example, nobody under median income would be worse off or things like that, you know, very, uh, what can you kind of package or tell specifically people who are going to be on the doorstep and are keen to sort of put this message across, what would be your top three of this is what you should be saying. Yeah, let, let's let's come back. Um, uh, Jane, do you want to have a first first crack at that? Because I, I think for me, that in a sense is is one of the challenges here. It's we can have these conversations like in sort of seminar format. But you, you know, as well as I do that on the doorstep, it can be I mean, you might get a few minutes, but you might get, you know, 10 seconds and, and that's it. So uh, is this one that you'll reach for and make a centerpiece of the campaign? Well, we have here in Wales, um, so it, we adopted it at our conference uh, at the weekend. It's obviously federal policy at the moment. Uh, we want a trial of universal basic income in Wales. And uh, on the phones, because obviously we're not allowed to knock on doors at the moment, and we won't be able to do that up until the Senate elections in May. On the phones, we do talk with people about it. And actually, what we say is um, that it, it will mean that people will not drop below a median level. That's absolutely what we say. But we also say we want to have a fully costed proposal because we're in a pandemic right now and we need to see what coming out of this pandemic looks like. I think there's another key issue, if I just may leap in here, which is how are we going to pay for it? I hear that all the time. How are we going to pay for it? You know, surely we can't afford it. Well, you've heard from Wendy, you know, test and trace cost X billion. I've forgotten what the figures are. Um, but two weeks ago, uh, the government sold off the seabeds uh, or are selling off the seabeds off uh, the coast of the UK. And the UK government will get 300 million pounds a year over 10 years for uh, selling off the seabeds. Now we want a sovereign wealth fund. That's what we want. And that from that, we want to then build up a position so that we can pay for a much higher 
universal basic income. But I think we need to be really careful. We don't give facts and figures until we're out of this pandemic because put re putting the recovery first is the most important thing. It, it does seem to me that you're, you're tapping into a really important idea there, which is that if you can, if you can somehow um, create the fund, which is based on commonly owned assets by people, then you, you destroy the argument that this is free money being given to people. This is actually then just an entitlement. It's, it's money that already belongs to them. And they're just getting their share of it. Absolutely. So think, just, to, yeah. just to say very quickly, we sold off all the council houses. Where did the money go? We sold yeah. off the oil fields. Where did the money go? Four occasions, dare I say, the Conservative government lost to create this sovereign wealth fund. And that's exactly what they've done in Alaska. Uh, sadly, through the oil fields, we wouldn't want to go there, really. Yeah. Um, but actually, we do need to be building up this money which belongs to us as UK citizens. That's exactly what we need to be doing. And then we need to be looking at how that is distributed to every single person, because it's our money. And we need to make sure that we have this to create that equality, fairness and freedom in our society. Thanks, Jane. Wendy, did you want to have a, a crack at those questions we had? Yeah, I, I was just thinking in terms of the doorsteps. So obviously, we're, we're, we're not on the doorsteps. And I, am I directly discussing UBI when I'm, I'm checking in with constituents? No, I'm not, because, because I suppose selling a policy proposal to constituents is probably not where we are just now. And I suppose the reality is, is we're, when we are able to knock on doors, we'll be at the, the thin end of the wedge in relation to campaigning. So, you know, the reality is, is we don't have the long form conversations. You're getting your voter intention and you're, you're moving on but you know what we are doing or what we have been doing is how are you how have you been finding the pandemic what support have you had and then usually you have a conversation about what support they've had in their community and actually food banks comes into that and so that's why I did mention that EPPG for ending food banks because you know that is a very visible in every community now um, a way of, of of offering of offering help, but potentially it's not a very dignified one. It's one that has a sense of shame attached to it, and one that generally across the UK nobody is particularly proud about the fact that we have. And the reality is, is use of food banks has increased every year for the last five years. So it's not pandemic related. Mm. So for me, uh, you know, uh, we, we're not going hard sell on UBI, but I think it is part of a genuine conversation around the fact that the current systems aren't working. The government focus, for example, on how well universal credit has managed over the, the, the last year. And that's true for, for you know, a, 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 the, the increase that we have seen in the system. But for me, it's been very striking. I sit on Scottish Affairs Committee and we're currently doing, we're currently doing um, a, an inquiry into welfare in Scotland. And the reality is, is that there is a different conversation in Scotland around welfare. So the social security system feels different because it does feel like it's a supportive place. Now, obviously, um, that's the Scottish government, the SNP, and as a Liberal Democrat, you know, I'd prefer that we were in government. But I do think there's that change in, co in, in conversation. And that plays into some of the stuff that, that Jane has said. But, but I agree, you know, numbers currently uh, are potentially meaningless. It is about putting that recovery first and, and potentially then those radical ideas come behind it. And then would you would you also say that it, it, it's about explaining to it's about creating the narrative that the pandemic has exposed some of the fundamental weaknesses and injustices in our society and, and that we can't go on like this. And, and, and in the sense, you know, creating that more fertile environment within which later the arguments about the solutions. Yeah, can be. yeah I think you're absolutely right. And, and it's interesting, Ian, because in some ways, you know, people would argue that we're a more individual, individualistic society, but actually in some ways, some of the impact of, of COVID has brought out the best in, in, in communities as well, um, where, you know, I, I certainly remember that the, the COVID groups on, on Facebook um, in local communities across my largely rural constituency sprung up well, well before the council operations it's swung, in, swung into motion. Mm. So and that, you know, in terms of, well, here's a, here's a notion for you, that big society that David Cameron spoke about, and, and arguably some respects, UBI has a part to play in that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Chiwe, do you want to uh, make a couple of comments in reaction to what you've been hearing? 
Yeah, yes, thanks a lot. Um, I, I think it's, 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 um, it's hopeful that people can, stew, can start to do um, door to door campaigning slightly. I, I don't know how, how much of, how much leeway we, where people will actually get. But um, looking at the women's vote um, and, and how crucial it is, I think the challenges that the last year has presented definitely resonate with a big quota of women. And I think there's lots of, there's a big case to be made um, for why you should be voted for as, as Lib Dems that um, are for you universal basic income. Um, and people would want to hear that that's being championed and that they're being looked out for. Um, I, I don't know if you've picked up as well in the last few weeks that a lot of women have been forced, not really been made to, but they've been forced to leave work in order to look after their children. That started off with the United States producing those, those statistics. And um, now the United Kingdom has also started to see that trend. They've been forced to leave work not because of any other reason, but because it's just been difficult <clears throat> to, to manage that. They were not in time. Yeah. Thanks, Chiwe. Um, Daniel, let's just let's take a couple more uh, from chat. Um, I know that we're up at the point really at which we said we'd be ending the meeting. If any of our panelists need to leave, uh, nobody's going to hold it against you, given the phenomenal amounts of work you guys are all doing. Um, so please, if you need to leave, you do. But um, for that, we've still got 78 people on the call. And um, uh, let's take a few more from the chat. And, and just uh, unless somebody shouts at me and says we can't do it, we'll just run on for an extra few minutes. I'm certainly happy to stay until nine o'clock, Ian. I'd be comfortable with that. So I need to probably go back to my flat at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. What have you got for us, Daniel? Um, so, so there's 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 another question around, you know, in terms of what whether the Lib Dems are proposing this idea of pilots around, you know, this sort of election cycle, and you know, uh, question from Peter, what would you want a pilot to achieve? Um, is there some information we don't have, and so what kind of experiment would you need it to find that that information out? But I guess the the, the broader question is, does the party is the party calling for? For pilots at this stage, rather than a full-blown UBI. Right. Maybe um, when did you want to have first crack at that? I know you said you were on the, the working group, and, and if I may, just tag one on onto the end of that, which is, do we? I mean, there have been a lot of pilots in lots of different parts of the world. The evidence is piling up. Uh, and this is not intended to be critical of us or as a party or anything like that. But I mean, to what extent are politicians just bottling it because they haven't got the answers on the numbers? In other words, pilot is a, a good thing to call for. It's small it's, ma small, it's manageable, it doesn't scare too many people. But at some stage, one has to move beyond pilots, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I joked and I said commission because that's something the Scottish government are very good at doing and they launch a commission and there's going to be a report and then it kind of all, all kind of dwindles away. I think there is, a, you know, there is a bit of that, Ian, but I also think that this is you know, and the reason why I said what was the one ask, I think we sort of definitely need to have some sort of universally agreed basic tenants. So there are lots of pilots, but actually probably in some respects, they had some key fundamental um, differences. From my perspective, uh, Fife Council, um, not within North East Fife, but Fife Council have been supportive of a pilot. And obviously because of that, um, I would certainly uh, like and want to, to see it. But I suppose there is that bit of, what can Liberal Democrats as the fourth party in UK politics realistically achieve? And I suppose that's where it comes to the fantastic work that Chiwi and others have done in relation to councils calling for it. Because I suppose, you know, what's our, one of our fundamental beliefs as Liberal Democrats in terms of devolving power to where it can, you know, where it can be, be most effective. And so potentially for me, if a local authority makes a decision to either move forward with a, a, a pilot or indeed otherwise uh, and, and can implement it, um, uh, more, 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 power to, more power to them. Thanks. Jane, do you want to come in on this one? Yeah, I, I think there is a difference between a pilot and a, and, uh, a trial. Um, we have had loads of pilots and um, they do have, you know, different applications. They go for different lengths of time. We've, we're calling for a trial in Wales. That's what we're doing. And that has to cover the whole of Wales. 
that has to ha mean that we get the welfare powers to do it and that we have to have it over a very clear period of time, um, which um, then has very clear outcomes. Um, so that's what we're calling for. Um, and we just need to get on with it. You know, it, it, it isn't, it, it, we've got loads of stuff out there, loads of pilots, loads of information and evidence. 69% of people in Wales want it. We have a town in Wales which has more food banks than supermarkets, um, and there, there, there's a there's a real clear reason why we want it. We want us we want to be able to ensure that people don't go to food banks, and that for me, for me, if we do that, fabulous, we'll have done it. So just just so people are clear about what you're saying there, you're, you're basically saying you want a full you know the full policy implemented for a period of time after which you know you can take stock on what the impact has been so in in a sense you're not saying this this is it this is here to stay permanently unless the trial is successful and demonstrated to be successful is that absolutely. fair absolutely yeah it has to be that way we because I, I just don't know how you do it otherwise you know i don't know how you say let's have a have it in a in one little area and one person on one side of the street has it and the other person doesn't. They're under exactly the same circumstances. And actually, you know, we, we have immense challenges here in Wales. 25% of our children are um, living in poverty. Um, we've got to have a different system. You know, the, the benefit system is an absolute disaster. Universal credit is an abomination. We have to change things and we have to do, be radical. To, we have to work with other parties to do it though. And, and here in Wales, obviously, you know, that's critical for us as Liberal Democrats. We are getting people moving and we are getting some movement to be able to bring people on board. Cross party working, working with other organisations, listening to people who run food banks, etc. Those are the, that that's the way the system can be set up. So I want to see a trial across the whole of Wales. Thank you. Um, Daniel. I think you came to me. You were a bit muted. I think, there. I think Ian's. I think Ian's sound has gone. I think we. I think we've sort Do of. It, probably, can oh, you hear yeah. me now? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Flo, John. I was just going to ask you, unless unless we need to end, John, unless that's what you were going to tell me. I, I, think, I think we're, we're being nudged that we might have to. I'm afraid. So. Okay, uh, that's fine. Well, in, well, in which case, in which case, uh, as you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to. Hand, I'm actually going to hand over to John, so John can say. Um, a few things about upcoming events and, and things uh, that the campaign would like you all to be looking to do next. But just before I, I do that, let me just say uh, thank you to, to all of the panelists uh, this evening for fantastic contributions to all, all of you. The, the sort of passion, the commitment, the clarity of thinking, um, the depth of knowledge, I think has been really impressive. And I hope that uh, people uh, watching and participating in the chat and so on have found it a really, a really valuable event. John, over to you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, yeah, folks, so just, just to finish things up, uh, I'm one, part of the team at uh, Lib Dems for Basic Income, little informal campaign group, and we'd love you to sort of get involved a bit more. I've posted in the chat the, the, the WhatsApp uh, chat link to join our kind of broadcast group so you can get the updates from us. And then from there, it's very easy to get more involved and, and we, we, we'll, we'll sort of post any, any upcoming meetings and that sort of thing that you can come and join us in. Uh, and I've also posted the link to our, our sort of our Twitter feed. So do tag us, and and if you've got questions or ideas or whatever, and, and and be part of the conversation that way. And then and then come deeper and deeper into our our, our exciting little world. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the the two the two things that are coming up, we have. Um, two really exciting events that uh, one of which really directly answers a lot of these questions we, we've we've uh, we're working with the social liberal forum which i'm also involved in we're hosting an event called what kind of ubi on the 29th of march which will go into these questions about models and costs and, and that's in fact in response to a report that, that the slf has commissioned from a from a u.s think tank called the ubi center which will also be addressing the the federal policy committee in the meantime so that should be a really good event jane jane and and will be one of the discussants at that as will Paul Noblet who's chair, chairing the Federal Policy Working Group as well as the UBI Centre from the US. So that's on the 29th. 
Uh, and then very excitingly, we've literally just today, and, and by being on this call, you're one of the first to hear that this is going to be happening. Uh, Michael Pugh, who you met at the very beginning of this event, and I have managed to make contact with uh, Mayor Michael Tubbs in Stockton, California, uh, who is also the founder of the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income campaign over there. And, and Tubbs has agreed to, as he goes, apparently, Tubbs has agreed to join us for, uh, for, for an evening with him on the 12th of April. Uh, now, if you've seen any of the press recently about the, the results of the of, of the Stockton trial, it's really one of the one of the most exciting ones going uh, for, for an awful lot of reasons. So some really exciting stuff. We as the Lib Dems are right at the heart of it, and it's a great thing to be part of. A couple of takeaways from me, just the very final final things to take away. Like I thought Nate Nate's thing of like we can't afford not to do it has really stuck with me. The kind of the costs of not doing something like this, I think, has has really clunked something in my head. Uh, and then just to share with you that the, my favourite quote and my favourite sort of sentiment on all of this from the very beginning has been Paddy Ashdown uh, writing in Citizens Britain in 1989 that every step we take towards a basic income liberates power in the hands of the citizen. And I think that that spirit of like what we're really doing is a very core kind of liberal idea is, is, is very exciting. So I think it falls on me to close the event to give one last big thank you to, uh, to Wendy, Jane, Chiwei and... And, and Louisa and, and Nate in their absence, and to Michael, uh, Mike and the Basic Income crew to, for hosting, and to Ian, our chair. And uh, we'll see you at another event very soon. Thank you for coming. <laughs>